Okay. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I want to thank everyone for joining this evening. Um, my name is Eleanor Rangers, and I'm the president of the Southeastern Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization uh, that's run out of uh, Warminster, Pennsylvania, uh, Southeastern Pennsylvania, and we are actually celebrating our 11th year. So we want to thank you for joining us this evening for our ongoing <laughs> lecture series, now webinar series, um, for the at least for the time being until uh, hopefully we have an end to our ongoing uh, infectious disease ex adventures. Um, I uh, will have a few uh, introductory remarks and then we'll introduce our speaker this evening. This um, is being recorded and we do upload these webinars uh, to um, our YouTube channel that's under our, the same name of our organization. So you have to check that out. Um, and I do request that if you could all mute your lines um, during the presentation, um, but certainly we'll have plenty of time for Q&A afterwards um, and when you can meet your line. So again, thank you. And again, uh, this is our organization. We've been around since 2010. Um, and here we are with our uh, 2021 lecture series. And as we know, we've gone virtual um, and we run these uh, through the Zoom platform. Just as a reminder, if any of you are not receiving our emails or if you've not had a chance to go to our upgraded website um, where we do list our events for the entire year, this is a list of what's upcoming for our events. You can see today uh, with uh, Gary Powers, who we'll introduce momentarily. But then we have monthly lectures going all the way um, through October. I sort of have a TBD for November because that's traditionally when we have our veterans tribute. So um, I'm still, I'll be planning for some of that uh, towards the latter part of the summer. Um, and then we'll round out the, the last part of the year actually with a pretty exciting lecture in December. We're gonna bring in a panel uh, this year of individuals who actually worked at or rode the Johnsville centrifuge. So um, you will get to hear from the people in the know about what it was like to actually work or ride that centrifuge. Um, so definitely looking forward to that as well. Um, if any of you would like to get on our email distribution list, um, just shoot me an email at mail at coldwarhistory.org uh, or you can go to our website, again, coldwarhistory.org and there is a contact button there where you can send us an email. So um, just wanted to give you a heads up to that. Um, as I mentioned, our webinars are available um, on our YouTube channel, and there are some other uh, things that I kind of try to keep up, uploaded there and to keep it sort of fresh and current. Um, we have some information about the Johnsville Centrifuge, um, as well as highlights of some of the oral history interviews that we've actually conducted over the years. And as I mentioned, we're in our 11th year, we've conducted over 116 interviews um, over time. So uh, a good chunk of them, probably about a third to 40% uh, of the highlights are, are up there for you to uh, take a look at if you so desire. And I also just want to put a plug again. I'm pretty proud of our new improved website. Another, this was another windfall uh, from uh, our, our COVID time and a lot of time at home. I finally decided to bite the bullet and do a nice upgrade to our website and uh, worked with a lovely gentleman uh, web designer in the, the um, Southeastern Pennsylvania area. I always like to try to support local business there if I can. Um, so if you have a chance, check out the website. Um, when we finally had a chance to put all of the things up there that we've been doing over the last 10 years, it's actually quite a lot. So there's a lot of stuff to see. Um, and also our events listings are located there as well. Um, so uh, that's another you know, easy place for you to find out what's going on uh, with programming through this organization. Um, we also have a Facebook page if you're active on Facebook. Um, and uh, you can check us out there. I do post there relatively regularly and I do keep um, uh, our events uh, updated on that page as well. So I uh, just wanted to give you a heads up to that as an alternate way of reaching us. And one other thing I wanna give a plug for, we actually unveiled this in no uh, November when we had our last veterans tribute. Something that's been kind of on my bucket list for some time was to have some sort of perpetual commemoration for veterans from the southeastern Pennsylvania area. And interestingly enough, there really was nothing. Um, you know, there were some local um, 
selective like memorials to Vietnam veterans, for example, but really no, um, I guess, global um, way of honoring living and deceased uh, veterans from the area. So um, we've actually developed another website that is a virtual wall of honor. Um, and uh, if you'd like to, if you are a veteran from the southeastern Pennsylvania area, even if you're not residing there now, but are originally from that area, we'd love to have, uh, have you upload a biography so that we can uh, post you there. We do have a fair number of um, biographies that are up there now. So I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, and it is run basically through our organization. And, um, you know, definitely take a look and uh, just want to thank people for the service. Something else just to mention, I have to do the shameless promotion. Um, as a nonprofit organization, we basically operate on, you know, on a string and we basically benefit from the generosity of any of our supporters. And um, if you so desire to make a donation, there is a way to do that very easily on our website. Um, but also another easy way to um, donate to our organization is through Amazon, believe it or not. Um, if you go to something called smile.amazon.com, there's a way in which you can select the, your nonprofit organization of choice and a small portion of your um, sales will be um, basically reciprocated and donated by Amazon to our organization on a quarterly basis. So um, very easy way, seamless way to do that. Um, but we also um, do accept um, donations directly. Those are tax deductible um, and you will receive a receipt, um, you know, for that information. So, um, and, you know, in terms of what that goes towards, it's very modest. I mean, it allows us to bring in speakers like Gary Powers, for example. Um, it allows us to upkeep our website assets um, and, you know, for some other longer term projects. Like one thing I've been wanting to do forever in age is to transcribe all of our uh, miscellaneous interviews to actually add to our um, ongoing collection of uh, interview archives. So those are basically the types of things that we look for support for. It's it, that's all it is. It's for historical preservation purposes. So I just want to give you a little FYI about that. And I guess I've already talked about that. Um, and, you know, we are always looking for volunteers as well. Uh, if you do have interest in assisting the organization, a lot of this can be done remotely. Um, you know, we certainly have uh, the need for um, cataloging um, items. We do have a fair number of uh, artifacts and articles and pictures and so forth that really we could use some help with. Um, and uh, also even community outreach, some simple things. If you wanted to be trained as sort of an, a, uh, you know, advocate for the organization and, you know, to be able to go out and just kind of let people know what we're all about, that's something else we, we certainly would welcome. And, uh, you know, even some other things, like if you have grant writing expertise, um, you know, one other source, of course, for nonprofits uh, are some limited, um, you know, grants that come out for nonprofits. Um, and I'd love to be able to pursue some of that. And if anyone has expertise in that, we'd love to, uh, we'd certainly love to hear from you. Um, I will tell you that I actually, another thing that I said I'm going to do this over the holidays was to finally clean up my email list. <laughs> I was getting a lot of bounce backs, old emails and so forth. Finally had a chance to really purge that. Um, so I think I've been able to sort of clean things up. But if it turns out that you thought you were on our email list and you're not getting emails, um, send us a new email through our website, um, through that mail at, his, at coldwarhistory.org, and uh, we'll be sure to get you on the mail list again. But again, you do have other access. You can get on, you can find us through Facebook, um, the website, um, you know, so there are ways of at least reaching us, fortunately. Um, I just want to mention that, but I guess just to close out, Thank you as always for your, your continued support. We very much appreciate it. It's always a kick to actually see, oh, wow, people do dial into these webinars, <laughs> amazing. Um, you know, something else I wanna mention before we formally introduce Gary, um, it's a little sad, but um, actually about just about a year ago in February, 2020, was the last time we had a live program at uh, our live venue, the Johnsville Centrifuge. And um, these are some photos I took of our first and only so far um actually gary uh joined us that evening 
um, where we had a viewing of Bridges Spies. Um, of course, Gary will have a chance to talk about the why, you know, how that involves his father, uh, Francis Gary Powers. But you can see a picture of Gary there uh, doing a Q&A after the viewing um, and the audience. We had a really great turnout that night. It was actually really fun. We had a lot of great reception about those movie nights. And I've been collecting a list of Cold War movies that eventually, if and when we can get back to doing these live, I'd love to be able to do an, a movie night again. So, um, so I just thought it was kind of ironic how things have come uh, full circle. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Gary. Um, and just so you know, I will be serving as the audiovisual tech this evening. So um, we will have some, a little bit of slides, maybe some video. So just bear with me when I'm switching between those platforms. But let me introduce the man of the hour, Francis Gary Powers Jr. Born in June, 1965 in Burbank, California. He's the son of Francis Gary and Claudia Sue Powers. He's the founder and chairman emeritus of the Cold War Museum, which is a 501c3 charity located in Vent Hill, Virginia, which is about 45 minutes west of Washington, D.C. He founded the museum in 1996 to honor Cold War veterans, to preserve Cold War history, and to educate future generations about this time period. Um, as chairman of the Presidential Advisory Committee of the Cold War Theme Study, he also works with the National Park Service and leads Cold War experts to identify historic Cold War sites for commemorating, interpreting, and preservation. He is also the author of a couple of books, including Letters from a Soviet Prison um, and Spy Pilot, uh, which are, were written to help to dispel misinformation surrounding uh, the U-2 incident and um, his father. Um, he is a board member of the Strategic Air Command and Aerospace Museum uh, near Omaha, Nebraska, on my bucket list to hopefully see someday. Uh, he's also an honorary board member of the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. And because of his efforts to honor Cold War veterans, the Junior Chamber of Commerce selected him as one of the 10 outstanding young Americans uh, for 2002. Um, he's also consulted for Steven Spielberg um, on the movie Bridge of Spies, uh, which uh, was uh, about James Donovan, uh, who brokered the 1962 spy exchange between KGB spy Rudolf Abel and, uh, of course, um, Francis Gary Powers Sr. Um, Gary lectures internationally and appears regularly on many shows on television, including the History Channel, Discovery, A&E Channels. You can see uh, many of those show video clips um, on YouTube, actually, because I was as I was preparing for this lecture this evening and he is married and has one son. So with that, I am going to turn this over to Gary and I'm going to bring up the uh, slides and you can let me know um, which things to turn to if and when. So with that. Well, sure. well thank you very much, Eleanor, for the uh, introduction and the invitation to join you tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm not going to be doing a actual formal presentation per se. Uh, it's more of a dialogue between Eleanor and I asking questions, giving answers and talking about what I've been doing the last 25 plus years. Um, I'll start with a little overview um, of what uh, we see in the uh, screen. And maybe it's just best to talk about what's on the screen as Eleanor goes through it. and We can go that route. So what you have up here are the two uh, books that I've written. Uh, the first one, Letters from a Soviet Prison, The Personal Journal and Private Correspondence of CIA U-2 Pilot Francis Gary Powers. That book is a primary source document. I decided to publish my father's letters as well as the journal he kept while incarcerated. I wanted it published for the historical record. His thoughts, his feelings, his hopes and despairs while incarcerated. I thought it was very important uh, for future generations to have access to this primary source documents where they can read firsthand what he had gone through, his notes and his feelings about being shot down, his recollections, what it was like to be in a Soviet prison that led up to the exchange in February of 62 for Soviets by Rudolf Abel. Gary, can I, can I interrupt you for a second? A question regarding um, the, this book. What, it yeah. seems so surprising to me that your father was allowed to keep a journal and that you have this primary source document. Um, any, any comments regarding that? Um, the reason my father started to keep a journal is that while he was incarcerated in Vladimir prison, his cellmate 
asked him, why aren't you keeping a journal? <laughs> Eventually, when you go home, you're going to want to remember certain things that you've experienced or notate so that you can recall it. And so my father started writing this journal in the Soviet prison sometime, I want to say, in about uh, September, October of 60, after he was shot down and imprisoned uh, at the Lubyanka prison, then the show trial, he was transferred over to Vladimir. So that's where he started to write this journal. He was always a little um, careful with it. I'm sure they knew he was writing it. I'm sure that it was read when he was not in the room. Mm -hmm. But basically, it was um, just talking about everyday life uh, in the Soviet prison, uh, his thoughts, his feelings, his hopes and despairs. He uh, talked about... Um, the marriage that he was uh, 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 married to this first wife, uh, Barbara Gay Moore, and the marriage disintegrated while he was in prison. And that aspect of his life, of this disintegration of his first marriage while in prison is documented in the journal. So um, I'm not sure why they allowed him to, quote unquote, other than uh, he was able to write letters back and forth to his parents, his loved ones. Uh, he was able to keep a journal he didn't put anything in the letters or the journals that would uh, cause suspicion or get him in trouble. It was more just for documenting um, uh, what he was going through at the time. Got it. Now, I do also remember that when he was being exchanged on February 10th of 62, um, he was concerned, are they going to let me take this home? So he basically just stuffed it in the bottom of the suitcase and out he walked. Wow. Wow. So in many respects, we're very lucky. Mm -hmm. to, have, uh, to have gotten that. Um, I do want to just request if anyone is not muted, because we are getting some feedback on the line, if you could kindly um, mute or I will go ahead and mute you. <laughs> so um, this, All oh, right, go ahead, and, go ahead and continue. I'm sorry. Yep, uh, the second image up there is my second book that came out in 2019 called Spy Pilot, Francis Gary Powers, The U-2 Incident and the Controversial Cold War Legacy. And that title really sums up what that book is all about. I've been doing research for over 30 years on the U-2 incident, my father, uh, the U-2 program, the Cold War. I wanted to find out the truth of what took place. When I was growing up, I heard all these rumors, speculation, misinformation, some outright lies about what my father went through, um, what happened to the U-2 incident, uh, with the U-2 incident, what was the cause of the shoot down, was it a flame out, was it a UFO, was it a sabotage, did he defect? So I wanted to find out the truth. And I primarily wanted to find out the truth. These people were curious. They would ask me questions. And when I was a kid in high school, I didn't know what the answers were. So oftentimes I wouldn't answer questions because I didn't know how to answer them or what the answer is war. Mm -hmm. And so that put me in a little bit of a, a predicament and that some friends at school, I mean, sometimes they would think, well, you're talking about your dad, you're boasting and you're bragging. And then if I didn't talk about it, I didn't answer questions. Oh, he's, he's aloof. He feels he's superior to us. So here I am stuck in the middle trying to figure out who my dad was after he passed away why everybody knew him or it seemed that way, why people wanted to ask me questions that I, at the time I really didn't know how to answer. So in college, I came out of my shell. I started to uh, do research and it snowballed. I started talking to family members. That led to talking to CIA and FBI and State Department Air Force officials. That led to talking about uh, or uh, talking with uh, World War II veterans and finding out as much as I could on the Cold War to understand the U-2 incident to learn more about my dad. Mm -hmm. So this book is basically 25 years of research, five years to write it with a co-author, Keith Donovan, and then uh, it was published in 2019. Yeah. 2019 was a very good year. I was on probably 100 uh, speaking uh, 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 lectures around the country and internationally. I was geared up in 2020 to do the same thing, another 100 plus lectures in March, of last year. I'm in California. I'm on a three-week tour doing book signings and lectures and things like that. March 17th hits, everything falls apart. COVID virus ravages the country. I hop on a red-eye flight home. I get home the day before LA shuts down. And from that moment on, the last, what, 12 months now, basically, 11 months, um, it's been a bust. Yeah. I lost 50 lectures because of the COVID. Uh, I am now starting to reschedule them and doing virtual presentations, but boy, was 2020 rough. <laughs> yeah. So this book basically sets the record straight. 
It takes Dad's reputation from infamy and controversy in the 60s to that of an American hero today. It goes through what it was like to grow up in the shadow of a famous figure. It goes through uh, what it was like to lose my father when I was 12 years old, when he died in a helicopter crash while working for NBC. And then it goes on to uh, talk about the research I've done that sets the record straight. This research resulted in dad being posthumously awarded the POW medal in, 20, in 2000. And then he was awarded the silver star in 20, uh, 2012 because of the research uh, that I was able to do that showed the truth of what took place. So I'm very proud to have these two books to my credit. The first one is self-published. You can buy it on Amazon, eBay, or through my website. And then Spy Pilot is officially published through a publisher. You can also buy it on those things through bookstores as well. And if you want autographed copies or a personal inscription, you can go to GaryPowers.com or SpyPilotBook.com. And I have to say, just as an endorsement, if you have not read Spy Pilot, I'd very much encourage people to read it. It's it's a great read. It's very it's a very fast read, I, I felt, and it was just very entertaining. So um, I, I really enjoyed it very much. Um, so um, thank you. I'm glad you little, did. Little endorsement there. So at um, least one person has enjoyed it. <laughs> at least one person has. Um, so, you know, I'm going to I'm going to maybe start with um, I'm going to go through the slide view, so bear with me, but I wanted to pull up a couple of photographs that were of your, of uh, his family, I guess your, oh, uh, sure. yep. and, and basically wanted to um, basically have you talk a little bit about these family members and also, I mean, where um, your dad was from, um, mm -hmm. you know, his roots, so. Well, um, my dad uh, was born on August 17th, 1929 in Southwest Virginia. Technically, he was born in Kentucky at the local hospital, the closest one to Pound, Virginia. Pound, Virginia is in Southwest Virginia, as close to Kentucky as you can get without being in Kentucky. Um, dad was raised during the height of the Depression. He was born in 29, a few months before the stock market crash, Black Friday in October. Uh, and he was basically 12 years old in uh, 1940 um, uh, when the Depression started to end with the entering into World War II. Uh, the pictures that you have here on this screen are of the family. Uh, the top right, I believe it is everybody's right, uh, the two individuals are my grandmother, Ida Ford Powers, and my grandfather, Oliver Powers, dad's parents. Uh, they were hard working individuals. Um, farmers, shoe cobbler, uh, maybe a little bootlegging in the day, <laughs> as well as uh, working in the mines, anything they could, the coal mines, anything they could do to make a dollar to support the family. Uh, the, on the left, the three gentlemen sitting on the couch from left to right, you've got my father in his uniform, his dad, Oliver Powers, and his grandfather, James Powers. James Powers uh, relocated uh, to Virginia. I wanna say it was either his parents or his grandparents were the first in Virginia. Our family roots go back to 1654 in Massachusetts when um, William Power Powers landed uh, coming off one of the boats from England. And then from there, they spread out all over the country. Um, the bottom photo with the five ladies, those are my dad's sisters. And hopefully I'll remember all their names now. They're all days. <laughs> We've got Jess, Joyce, Jessica, Jean, Joanne. So he uh, was surrounded by five uh, girls growing up. He is the second oldest. So he uh, had uh, one older sister and four younger sisters when he was growing up. So that's just a little background about dad, where he was born, uh, where he was raised in Southwest Virginia. Uh, and his family, immediate family members. Okay, great. I'm going to actually pull something else up. So yeah, I thought those, and those pictures, as you know, came right out of Spy Pilot, but I thought it was great to provide a little bit more background, um, you know, about him. So um, I am going to skip actually all the way up to the top and thought maybe that you could talk a little bit about his going into the military, and then mm -hmm. what eventually led, of course, to his flying the, uh, the U-2. 
Sure. Well, as I just mentioned, this is a good segue. Uh, Dad grew up in Southwest Virginia, uh, one of six children uh, during the height of the Depression. I remember him telling me one story about how uh, he would lay, lay awake at bed, in bed at night. He would listen to his parents talking in the other room. Well, they were talking not about where the next dollar would come from, but where the next nickel would come from. It's the height of the Depression. So um, when he's about 11 or 12 years old, 1940, 1941, he is at a country fair. He begs his father for $2. $2 in 1940 was a lot of money. And he wanted to do an airplane ride with a female pilot in a Piper Cub. Oh, dad, please, you know, let me let me do that. I've always wanted to do this. This is something I've always wanted to do. Best begged his dad up and down. He finally relented, gave the son two dollars. Um, he did this airplane ride. The female pilot saw that he was all excited and, and encouraged him uh, uh, in aviation. She stayed up there an extra five minutes flying around with him. He lands. He gets hops out of the plane. He runs up to his parents, gives them a big hug, hug and thanks them. Uh, turns to his sister and says, one of his sisters, and says, I left my heart up there. And sure enough, from that moment on, he was going to be a pilot. He was determined to do that as a career. He is the first of his family to go to college. He attends Milligan College in uh, southeast Tennessee. Um, he graduates in 1950. He enlists in the Air Force against his parents' wishes. They want him to be a doctor. Doctors make good money, but dad decides to follow his own dreams and enlist in the Air Force uh, to uh, become a fighter pilot. He gets his wings in 1952. He's flying F-84s out of Turner Airfield near Albany, Georgia. Uh, he is then recruited by the CIA in the late 55, early 56 time period to fly the U-2 top secret um, spy plane. He is trained at Area 51 in the Nevada desert in early 56. He's shipped over to Interlake Air Force Base in mid-56. And this here is his squadron photo from the U-2 program while in Interlake Air Force Base. My father is in the back row on the top left. Um, he's the tallest pilot there, it looks like right now. Some of them are probably, probably slouching. I just want to make sure that my left and your left are the same. Yeah. Okay, good. So it's on his left. He's standing behind uh, next to uh, on the end. Uh, there were what is it, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve pilots in his squadron. Um, he was the B squadron. There was an A, a B, and a C squadron. One was stationed in Intralik. One was stationed in Japan at Sugi. One was stationed uh, in the UK or Germany, one of the other air bases. So basically, the U-2s would um, uh, take off from air bases around the Soviet Union. Wherever they needed to get photographic intelligence would determine what air base they would fly out of. You don't want to fly out of an air base over here if the target's over here. You want to fly out of here to get to a close target. Yeah. This is another photo of Dad when he was probably about 24, 25 years old, uh, very cold where he was, probably Buda, Boda, Norway is what my, I'm thinking. You've got the big, thick winter jacket on, uh, and you can tell that he's just a rugged looking, good looking guy in that photo. <laughs> <laughs> Here is uh, Kelly Johnston, the designer of the U-2 with my father in about 1963. Dad was a U-2 test pilot for Lockheed after coming home from the Soviet Union. Um, Kelly offered him a job as a Lockheed test pilot upon his return home. Uh, the Air Force was glad that that happened because they really didn't want to take him back into the Air Force, even though per his contract, he was supposed to go back in at a rank comparable to his peers. Dad had 12 more years to go. Is that right? I want to say 62. He had eight more years to go until he could retire. So his plan was to go back in the Air Force, retire, and, and, and uh, go that route. But because he was known spy, the CIA couldn't use him anymore. His cover was blown. The Air Force said, oh, Mr. Powers, you're a known spy. If we hire you, we will be accused of employing spies. That's not a good reputation to have for the Air Force. And Kelly Johnson came to the rescue uh, with offering a job as a Lockheed test pilot as, he could as long as he could pass the mental and physical examinations. Dad passed with flying colors. 
There was no ill effects from his incarceration. So he was able to be a Lockheed test pilot between 63 and 1970. Oh, wow. Now, you know, it actually, this reminds me of something that struck me when I was kind of re-reviewing Spy Pilot over the weekend. Um, it's something that struck me, and I mean, maybe this is like, oh, yeah, duh. Um, there was mention in there about the... Uh, um, about Eisenhower um, back at the beginning of the YouTube program and how um, he wanted to make this a quote unquote civilian program ah. for the uh, for the overflights. And it, uh, I was like, well, that's interesting. I never really made that connection because I know there was that impetus to have the space program, the space race, a civilian program. Mm -hmm. But I didn't realize that he also was very keen to have the perception that this, um, these overflights were not military. Um, and I don't know if you have any comments about that as well. Yes. It, just, it kind of- Oh yeah, you, you touch on a very important point there. Um, Eisenhower uh, wanted it to be a civilian program for a very important reason. If it was a military plane with a military pilot flying over a foreign hostile country, it would be an act of war. If it was a civilian program with a civilian pilot flying over a foreign hostile country, taking photographs, it would be an act of espionage. Eisenhower did not want to provoke the Soviets into World War III. He did not want a military operation. And that is why he uh, uh, mandated that it would be a civilian program. General LeMay, head of the Air Force, was pissed that's a plane that should be in the Air Force. So LeMay is lobbying to have it in the Air Force arsenal. And sure enough, some U-2s did go over there and Air Force pilots did fly them concurrently when the CIA pilots were flying them, but completely different missions, no penetration flights over hostile countries. Um, where was I gonna go with that? Um, oh, so um, when Eisenhower decides and mandates this. LeMay is upset. He wants it in the Air Force. Uh, Eisenhower explains for this reason, if it's an Air Force plane, an Air Force pilot, there'll be an act of war. I do not want to do that. It has to be headed up by the CIA. And so the CIA ran with it. Uh, Richard Bissell uh, was in charge of the program who reported directly to Eisenhower. Uh, and it gathered uh, wonderful photographic intelligence uh, for the four years it was operating over the Soviet Union. Mm, okay. Yeah, I just uh, actually just put up a picture of the U-2 for those that may not be familiar, uh, you know, with this aircraft. The other thing I thought was interesting is um, in reading the book was the comment about this was not an easy plane to fly. And it was so different from other jets that had been that were flying at the time that, um, well, it was intriguing to, to those pilots that wanted wanted to enter the program, but uh, it, it was not an easy airplane to to fly. And I don't know if you have any comments about that. Yes, well, uh, you're, you're partially right. It was a very easy airplane to fly. It was a very hard airplane to land and a very hard airplane to keep at altitude at 70,000 to 75,000 feet. Um, the, the dimensions were basically an 80 foot wingspan, a 40 foot fuselage. Uh, Kelly Johnson, the aeronautical engineer who designed the aircraft uh, was a genius. Um, he basically realized that in order to get a plane up to 70,000 feet at the time of out of the reach of Soviet missiles, that the plane would have to be very light. It would have to be a very long wingspan to generate lift. Uh, and it would have to have certain type of an engine and fuel mixture to operate in such a high altitude. So he was able to contract uh, with Pratt Whitney to design the uh, engines. Um, uh, they uh, contracted with a Kodak to develop the uh, camera and the film. Uh, basically, uh, Edward Land uh, helped to develop that uh, process, uh, part of the program. And then, of course, you had to have the plane built. So the structural integrity of the airplane was very, uh, how do I want to say this, limited. Uh, there were only three bolts that secured the tail section to the main airframe. So every pound of weight that they could save and shave off would allow them to fly another 10 feet higher. So they wanted to make sure that the plane was as lightweight as possible. It could fly as high as possible um, to photograph uh, military installations and bases and, and other uh, military industrial complexes in, over the former Soviet Union and other foreign hostile countries. The other thing um, with the plane is that 
at altitude when you're flying a mission at 70 to 75,000 feet. There is something known as the coffin corner. It was a seven knot window between stall speed where the plane would stall and it would have to descend to about 30,000 feet to ignite the engine so that it would go back up again and uh, where it would break the sound barrier. So you've got seven knots between stalling and falling out of the sky and breaking the sound barrier that would rip apart the wings and it would tumble down to the ground. So it was very um, uh, precarious to fly the plane and keep it within that seven knot margin while you're flipping on switches and navigating and, and getting to the destination. In addition, when landing the plane, very difficult to land. When Tony LeVere, the first pilot, test pilot for Lockheed to fly the airplane at the Nevada desert at Area 51 back in 55, I wanna say, yes, in 55, um, he's coming in for a landing and he's trying to land the plane. Well, it's porpoising. It hits the ground and goes up. It hits the ground and goes up. It hits the ground and goes up. It does not want to land. It is such a sleek design with the, or a, a, such a, a design for the uh, lift that the plane wants to stay in the air. And finally, he was able to figure out how to land it. When you're about 10 feet off the ground, you stall the plane intentionally. It settles down to the tarmac and it lands. So it's very easy to fly but very hard to maintain at altitude and very hard to land. Okay. Well, I wanted to ask about the U-2 just as a segue to talk a little bit about um, what your father's reputation was as a pilot. Mm. Um, and, you know, particularly, I mean, you're not going to be a slouch if you're going to be flying the U-2. So I wanted to, uh, to get your, you know, some thoughts about that. Oh, sure. Well, thank you. Um, Dad, as well as the other U-2 pilots, were basically the top gun of the time. Before there was a Top Gun, there was this U-2 program where the CIA recruited the best pilots out of the Air Force to do these missions. So my father, along with the other pilots, all had uh, certain mental qualifications, certain um, attributes about, um, uh, they're, they're, they're like basically all around American, true-blooded, red-blooded Americans. Just someone who was a very good pilot, had a mental competence, um, was able to follow orders and get a mission done and that could keep their mouth shut and not brag about what they were doing. Yeah. Um, actually, we have a question that came up in chat, which I think is a segue because I do want to get into exactly what occurred with your father's uh, fateful flight on, in 1960. Um, but this question actually comes from uh, Joan Larkin. And she says, can you please ask how and how often the U.S. determined the maximum altitude that the Soviets could reach with their countermeasures and how long before his father's flight, your dad's flight was the last time they checked? So I think that's a great question to segue into talking about what happened. Very good. Um, for the first four years, the U-2s were able to fly over the Soviet Union without being shot down. The Soviets had an SA-1 missile at that time. And the CIA analysts realized that it could only go up to 60,000 feet, which is why the plane was developed to fly at 70,000 feet and above. Here's a photograph of the SA-2. It's also in Russia known as the C-75. Um, but basically it's also the type of missiles that were used in Vietnam to shoot down uh, the American pilots there. Um, uh, they were used in um, Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, a U-2 was shot down over Cuba with an SA-2. The SA-2 is the new and improved missile. The SA-1s could only go up to 60,000 feet. The SA-2s, over four years of research and development between 1956 and 1960, the Soviets were able to improve their weapon system. They developed a new missile, the SA-2. It could now reach 70,000 feet. The CIA analysts at the time knew that they were developing this new missile. The April 9th, 1960 mission had a photograph of the SA-2 base near Sverdlovsk. So they were aware that it was coming online. For the May 1st mission, one of my dad's uh, uh, prerogatives was to overfly Sverdlovsk to see if the SA-2 missile was operational. Well, dad found out firsthand that it was. <laughs> it was the first time that the SA-2 had been fired in an actual uh, a battle scenario. 
Um, eight missiles were fired. One of them exploded near enough to the tail section to cause structural failure to the U-2. Dad bailed out, was captured, caught, tried, interrogated, and then I'll tell you that later. Um, another missile actually hit one of the MiG pilots' planes. And as a result of that pilot, the Sergei Safranov, uh, was killed by friendly fire in the line of duty. Here is a picture of Sergei along with the type of MiG that was shot down by their own missile on May 1st of 60. Uh, in the Soviet Union, that was never discussed. It was a secret until after the fall of the wall and after the fall of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Sometime in, I wanna say uh, 2000 to 2002, um, the, so the Russians declassified the fact that this pilot was shot down by their own missile, that it was a friendly fire incident. He was posthumously awarded the Red Star uh, for valor, um, and, and he is a, now a hero to the, so, uh, to the Russian people. I had the distinct privilege of visiting his memorial marker. If we can find that there, I can tell you a little story about what you're seeing. Yep. Um, this memorial marker uh, is in the city of Sverdlovsk. It is uh, near where the shoot down location was of the U-2 as well as the MiG pilot. This is a granite stone with the picture of Sergei Safranov on it. I had the privilege and the, and the honor to uh, be there in December of 2017 or 2018. I think it was 2017. I was on a uh, consulting trip to Moscow. I took a side trip to Sverdlovsk, uh, which is now known as Yekaterinburg. I was able to see the Boris Yeltsin Museum because Boris Yeltsin was born and raised there. That's where he was the district governor, for lack of a better term, until before he became president of Russia. Um, he, uh, I went to the shoot down location where the plane chunks hit the ground. I saw the impact crater. I went to uh, the field where my father landed, which is now a housing development. Um, and more importantly, I was able to go to this memorial uh, to pay my respects to Sergei Safranov. And the reason I wanted to do that, two, three years prior, probably in about 2015 or so, maybe a little earlier, I get a phone call from a person who represents the pilot's son, Sergei Safranov Jr. And I don't know if that's his name, but it's the father's, uh, the son's uh, father is the pilot. He would like to talk to me at the Cold War Museum when he's in the Washington DC area. And I'm thinking, oh my, what is this conversation gonna be like? Mm -hmm. um, so we agreed to meet at the Cold War Museum. We have an interpreter present. Uh, we have a wonderful conversation for about two hours and I have videotaped that, it's in my files somewhere. Um, basically just talking about his father, my father, what their careers were, what they remembered of them and, and other personal anecdotes. The thing that he told me that stuck out the most uh, and, and, and well, a couple of things. First, his dad died when he was about three years old. So he didn't really get to know his father, has no real memories of him. His mother, about seven years after her husband's death, married another fighter pilot from the squadron. Uh, and so that other pilot was basically Sergei's dad's uh, uh, stepdad and raised him and, and they had a very good life there in Russia. Um, Sergei told me during the course of the conversation that he, his, his mother wanted to relay this message to me. She did not blame my father for her husband's death. She knew that her husband was following orders, that my dad was following orders. It wasn't his fault that one of their missiles shot down her husband's plane. And so that was taken to heart. I was very appreciative that there was no animosity between the families. So when I get over to Sverdlov, to Yekaterinburg, I make a point to ask my host, hey, I'd like to visit this memorial. I'd like to pay my respects and present some flowers. So that morning, we're going around to all these locations. Um, I stop a little flower boutique shop. I get some roses. I'm in the van. There's press all around waiting for me to present these flowers. My hosts look at me and go, Mr. Powers, don't smile. What do you mean don't smile? There are cameras all around. What should I do? He goes, well, if you smile and appear as if you're happy while you're doing this, that will be an insult to the Russian people. You need to have a stone face. 
no emotion. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then he says, Mr. Powers, don't turn your back on the memorial. Don't turn my back, how do I walk away? You walk up, you present the flowers, you take some time to reflect, you stand up, you back away three or four steps, then you turn around and walk away. So I'm thinking, oh, thank goodness that I had a host who helped me to not have another international incident. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a great story. And, you know, the sad thing is I believe uh, he was only 30 when he died in the, in the line of duty. Yeah, and my dad was the same age, 30. Uh, he was his 31st birthday on August uh, 60. Wow, amazing. Well, maybe we could get into the actual uh, incident. And I think what I can do is I can pull up the map, actually. And then we do, I do have some photographs of the trial and so forth that we can, we can also pull up as well. So I'm going to let you kind of get into describing what happened that day. Sure. Well, um, after four years of successful missions, uh, May 1st mission is sl slated to take off on May 1st of 1960. The CIA wants just a few more photos of key targets in order to prepare President Eisenhower for his upcoming summit conference meeting with President C Premier Khrushchev. So they pester Ike to have one more overflight. And Eisenhower finally says, fine, but it can't take place after May 1st. I don't want anything to happen to the summit conference that's taking place on May 16th of that year. So my father is the pilot chosen. After four years, he is one of the highest, not highest, uh, one of the uh, pilots with the most number of hours, uh, most experience in the plane. This particular mission, as you can see by this photo, will go across the entire width of the Soviet Union, from Peshawar, Pakistan, down south, north over Sverdlovsk up to Boda, Norway, where it would have landed had it been a successful mission. So my father is slated to do this flight. He uh, takes off very early in the morning, 6.30 in the morning, uh, crosses the Soviet's border, four and a half hours into his mission, a total mileage of about 2,900 miles. He's now halfway there, about 1,400 miles, 1,500 miles within the Soviet Union. He is shot down by the near miss of a Soviet SA-2 missile. The missile explodes behind the tail section. It pushes the plane forward. It knocks the wings off. The plane goes into an inverted spin, tumbling down towards the ground. Uh, my father falls in the aircraft from 70,000 feet to about 30,000 feet. He's then able to bail out of the airplane. He does not use the ejection seat. If he did, he would have severed his legs. So he basically opens the canopy, floats off into space, undoes his harness, sucked up out of the airplane. He is still connected by his air hose, two or three feet of air hose, half in the cockpit, half out of the cockpit, bouncing around, face plates frosted over, can no longer see the destruct button, doesn't know how high he is, know he's getting closer to the ground. He breaks free of the air hose, falls free of the airplane, parachute opens automatically at 15,000 feet, he parachutes down to the ground. He is caught, apprehended uh, by the local authorities. He's turned over to the KGB. He's shuttled over to Lubyanka prison uh, by airplane and armed guard. Uh, and then he starts uh, uh, three months of interrogations in Lubyanka prison. Here you can see the U-2 wreckage. Um, the photo on the left, and I want to make sure that's the right wreckage because one of the photos was uh, of the wreckage was not correct. The Soviets intentionally released a fake photo ah. to the Americans. And I don't know if this is it or not because it's not the one I'm used to seeing. Um, but when Kelly Johnson saw the, this first photo, he said, that's not my plane. So they figured, oh, maybe they don't have the plane. We can release the cover story which was an unarmed weather research plane may have accidentally strayed across the border after the pilot had radioed trouble with his auction equipment. Can so I, I just say, why yeah. is it that the military's cover story is always, it's a weather <laughs> balloon or weather experiment, <laughs> always. Weather <laughs> balloon, UFO, 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico. Yes, <laughs> a routine weather research flight. Always. Um, or a training flight or other nondescript, very vague words to hide what they're doing, uh, which is why they use those. <laughs> um, so um, the other two pictures are the wreckage 
on display at the Central Armed Forces Museum in Moscow. Uh, at first, uh, back up, let me show you another wreckage picture, or if you can, uh, you can uh, do it. It's one with a lot of pieces on the table. I want to show that one first. Uh, I don't know if I have that. Here. No, no, I, I saw it. Oh, okay, hold on. Um, keep going, keep going. No, go up, sorry. Uh, on the right-hand side, far right, the helmet. This one? Yes. So that is a photograph of my father's flight suit and helmet that he was wearing on May 1st. It is next to, if you look you know, to the left and the right, the table was full of the U-2 wreckage. This was on display at Gorky Park in downtown Moscow uh, between sometime in May and August of 1960, leading up to the trial on August 17th. The Soviets were using this as a propaganda victory. They captured an American spy. They had shot down this spy plane. Um, they were sh uh, using it to the most uh, maximum uh, propaganda value as possible to further embarrass the United States during the height of the Cold War. So this is the, some of the uh, artifacts, the, the items that were on display uh, in uh, Gorky Park, along with the U-2 wreckage. That U-2 wreckage was then gathered up and then placed in the Central Armed Forces Museum. If we could go back to that photo, please. Yeah. And that is where it is still today. Um, I have talked with the director of the uh, uh, Central Armed Forces Museum on several occasions. I've lectured there in the past. Uh, he and I uh, uh, correspond by email occasionally if we have questions. Um, so in these two pictures, the one on the right and the one on the bottom, uh, you'll have the U2 wreckage. You'll see on the left, uh, okay, the far right photo, the left side is the air intake. You can see the air intake. The seat, the ejection seat is right there in the middle. And the U2 wreckage, fuselage and wing sections are in the back. On the bottom photo uh, is basically the same thing from a different angle a little far out. You can see the intake on the left, the seat, and then the fuselage and the wreckage components. So that is currently on display at the Central Armed Forces Museum in Moscow. I do have a chunk of that plane in my personal collection. It is part of the U-2 mobile exhibit that is currently on display at um, the SAC and Aerospace Museum uh, in Nebraska. Hmm. Okay. So maybe we can talk about the show trial. Um, and I have some photographs just to highlight that event. Okay. So while you're finding that photo, um, between May 1st and uh, August uh, 17th, dad was interrogated, 16-hour uh, days, bright spotlight, grueling questions, threats of death, uh, no physical torture, no physical abuse, but a lot of mental anguish, sleep deprivation, bright spotlight, grueling questions, threats of death. Um, during that interrogation time leading up to the trial, uh, dad was lying uh, the first week. My dad was lying to his captors outright, holding back as much information as possible, trying to mislead them any way wow. he can. But then on uh, May 7th, seven days into the interrogations, international press starts to write about the U-2 being shot down over Russia, that Eisenhower had been caught lying to the world public, that he said it was a weather plane. In fact, it was a CIA spy plane. So all of this press is being written. The KGB guard interrogating my father, a copy of the New York Times, rushes into the cell, shoves it in dad's face, yells at him, you've lied to us. You told us you were trained in Arizona. Well, the New York Times says you were trained in Nevada at Area 51. You might as well tell us everything. We'll get it out of your American press anyways. Hmm. So for the next three months, basically, dad does the following. He tells the full truth when he knows the KGB can find out the answers in the press. He lies to them when he knows there's no way they can find out the answer. Then he gives a part truth, a part lie, dances around the topic when he knows they know something about the question they're asking, but not enough to contradict his answer. Now, in regards to the trial, after three months of interrogations, he's put on a show trial in the Hall of Columns. Uh, the Hall of Columns, this particular place, uh, was the same location where Stalin did the purges in the 20s and 30s and the big show trials of that time when he was getting rid of uh, his uh, opponents and his opposition. Um, here is a photo of my father in the trial docket, a guard to his right, 
and in front of him is the court appointed, the Soviet court appointed uh, defense attorney. Now I have to point out that during the trial, not once did his attorney object to any question that was asked. Not once did his attorney really step up to the plate and come to bat for him. He did prevent my father from getting the death penalty. Well, maybe not him, but because of the way he worked it, and I believe that the system was rigged uh, with the uh, prosecution and the defense in cahoots with the judges, knowing the outcome of what was gonna happen. Um, my dad was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Wow, 10 years, that's a long time. But when you look at it from the Soviet perspective, it was lenient. Rudolf Abel, the Soviet spy who was captured in America in the late 50s, was sentenced to 30 years in prison. The Rosenbergs, who were caught spying for Russia, were executed. So when um, Rudolf Abel was captured, and here's a picture of Rudolf Abel uh, when he was captured in 57, uh, the hollowed nickel, which contained microfilm, which is what led to his, his capture, and then a postage stamp in his likeness as a hero to the Soviet Union that was uh, produced or uh, published back in 71, probably his uh, anniversary of his birth date or something. So um, when Abel was captured, we gave him 30 years. Um, when dad was captured and, and tried and sentenced, they gave him 10 years. The whole reason being they wanted, they, the, the Soviets, the KGB, wanted to show the world how humane they were, how nice they were, how they treated spies that were captured in their country to further embarrass the United States. So it was completely a propaganda uh, uh, event um, that was designed the show trial to embarrass the United States using my father as the pawn uh, in this international game of espionage and intrigue. Gary, qu question about that. Have you ever uh, tried to track down any of the people involved in the show trial? The, any of the, the, the lawyer or the family of the lawyer? Um, no, I, I'm not tried to track down any of the family members per se. I did try to get in touch with a, a relative, a, 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 an off, not offspring, a descendant of Rudolf Abel. And I thought I was going to meet with her sometime in 2018 when I was there in Moscow, but the meeting was called off last minute. Mm. Um, but as far as other people, the, 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 most of them are probably passed away by now. You would have to have been very young in 1960 to still be alive right now. Um, so um, the odds of me finding somebody are probably nil and none. Yeah. I was able to talk with uh, one of the missileers who designed the SA-2 missile. I was able to talk to a, a Colonel um, Alexander Orloff, who was a KGB guy, who was responsible for writing the interrogation questions given to my father. Um, his uniform, his colonel's uniform, uh, Alexander Orloff's is in the Cold War Museum's collection. He donated it to us 20 plus years ago when we were establishing the relationship. Um, and I've reached out to and I've talked to other people, but no one, uh, and a few people who attended the trial, uh, one of those uh, was a Lefevre. Uh, he was a press reporter who got in touch with me. He gave me his personal notes that he took at the trial along with uh, newspapers and other uh, artifacts, other uh, uh, items that were given out at the trial. So I did actually talk to a few people from the trial, but I never really looked for the prosecutor or the team or the defendants, things like that. Okay, yeah, I was just curious. And before we, we talk about these photographs here, uh, just a comment about Abel. Um, I know he was living in Brooklyn um, and was eventually apprehended there. Uh, and it was a newspaper boy, I think, that, that found the, the infamous nickel, right, that kind of led to that. Um, but how what, how, what type of big secrets was Abel uh, actually able to acquire during his active uh, time in the States? Just curious if we know that. Yes. Uh, well, um, Abel was ha the head of a spy ring in the U.S., and he was able to collect different information um, from the likes of uh, the Rosenbergs and other ground agents uh, working for the Soviet Union. Uh, he was able to gather information on nuclear secrets, on radar technology, on um, other aspects of um, uh, military strengths and weaknesses within the United States. 
So he did play a very vital, important role uh, in providing the Soviets with uh, information that helped them to improve their weapon systems uh, and eventually to shoot down the U-2. Wow. And how long was he active in the States? As a I don't know the year that he came in, but I do know that he was, quote unquote, an illegal. That's what they called people who would sneak in from the other country with fake documentation. Uh, he came in through Canada as um, an illegal. He set up shop in New York. He had his credentials, his driver's license, his passport, his documentation. Uh, he was an artist and a photographer. That was his cover. And he would paint pictures and, and do even contract work to make some money doing photographs and other work. But all the while, he's heading up this spy ring. Um, if um, we look at, uh, do we have the video clip of the movie Bridge of Spies by chance? I don't have that up. I don't have that queued up. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, because that would be a good way to show uh, when the FBI captures Abel as depicted in the movie. Um, but uh, a sting operation was set up after the paper boy found this nickel that opened up. And the dad, who happened to be a police guy, said, this isn't right. Let me call my friends at the FBI. So they said, oh, wow, where'd you get this? Well, I think I got it in this tenement. I'm not sure. I think it's this apartment building. So it took about two years for the FBI to figure out which building and then which room and then which person to go after. And in 57, uh, that's when they uh, finally uh, broke down the door, uh, ran in uh, and arrested Rudolph Abel. Wow. Incredible. Maybe you can talk about these photographs of your father uh, in prison and mm -hmm. the other things on the left as well. Oh, sure. So in the center is my dad uh, in his uh, overcoat. That's not the right word. In his over outing. Um, uh, 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 it's not even a uniform. It's his garment that he would wear over top of a flight suit. Um, and this is to show the Americans that he was in captivity, that he was alive. So that's what they released as proof of his capture. On the right is me. I am in my dad's prison cell at Vladimir Prison in 1997. I went on a spy tour of Moscow in 97, and I was able to get access to my father's prison cell through a very good friend of mine, Jim Connell, uh, who was working for POW MIA, the uh, Task Force Russia group that was looking for MIAs and POWs uh, shot down during the various wars from World War II to the Gulf War. Jim is friends with many of the prison commandants around Russia, who he talks with trying to figure out if any American service members were ever there uh, or if the known ones uh, were able to be uh, released or exchanged and just trying to find out the whereabouts or the, uh, what happened to these American uh, service members, as well as Russian service members, those who were shot down or missing in other parts of the world during this conflict. It was a joint effort to try to repatriate missing service members from each country. So he was able to get me into this prison uh, to uh, see my dad's prison cell. And it was, it was very eerie to be able to walking the same steps that my father had walked, to be in the prison cell. I sat down on the bed there and just kind of contemplated for a few minutes about what it was like to be there for 18 months. I was there for all of about 10 minutes, 18 months. Yeah. <laughs> this was too long. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to put these pictures side by side when I was pulling them last night and I thought, wow, it, they're, it's striking to see you there and then to see your dad and to see the resemblance. And it's really, it's, it's pretty chilling, you know, to think about what your dad went through. Oh, yes. That was one of the reasons I wrote the book. I wanted yep. to, you know, get, uh, get that across what it was like. Um, the one thing I do want to point out here is in the picture with me in the jail, in the, in the prison, there are four beds there. There are now four prisoners in that cell. When my dad was there, there was only two. Zergard, Kremisha, Latvian, and my father. So the prison population in Russia is probably rather large. Uh, so they had to, instead of doubling up, they had to quadruple up in the prison uh, rooms. Their rooms are about eight foot by 12 foot, very cramped space. The, the levers, the, the levers, levers uh, behind me on the window, they are pointed so they let sun in, but you can't see out. Mm. Um, and then the incandescent uh, light bulb up top uh, would be on 24 hours a day, but very dim at night, yet bright enough so the guards could look through the peephole to see if anything was going on that shouldn't be. The two photos on the left, 
the top photo is the journal that my father kept while incarcerated. So that's where he wrote down his thoughts, his feelings, and kept his uh, uh, um, uh, personal experiences in that journal. That journal is what I have transcribed, which is now in my book, Letters from a Soviet Prison. The bottom left photo is a, a replica of the hollowed out silver dollar uh, that was optional to take and optional to use. The silver dollar contained a little pin, small pin. You can see it sticking out of the right side of the dollar if you zoom up on it. Um, and it was dipped in curare, shellfish toxin. Um, it would uh, kill uh, the person who injected it uh, within 30 to 40 seconds. It would shut down the central nervous system and the pilot would appear to have died from lack of oxygen. Now, the reason uh, that my father's reputation was tarnished in a way is that he had this device on him. Well, if you have it on you, weren't you ordered to use it? Why did you have it if you weren't gonna use it? And the way it was explained to the pilots is that if you're caught, you will be tortured. Here is a way to alleviate the pain and suffering. It's an optional device to take, an optional device to use at the pilot's discretion in the event of torture. On May 1st, my father decides to take this device. It's my understanding it's the first time he took it in that it was the longest flight ever attempted across the entire width of the Soviet Union. I remember him telling me when I asked him, Dad, why did you take it? Um, he could use it as a weapon if he could try to escape. If he was in a crash, something happened, he's bleeding out, he could use it to alleviate the pain and suffering. And then of course, if he's uh, about to be tortured or uh, physically abused, he could use it to alleviate the, pain, alleviate the pain and suffering. When my father is parachuting out of the sky, he's falling out of the sky, he has this um, uh, medallion around his neck, uh, he takes it out, he looks at the pin, he looks at the silver dollar, he goes, you know, this is a really bad hiding place. This is the first souvenir that someone's going to want is an American silver dollar. He throws it away. Um, he takes the pin, which is covered in a small sheath, so you don't accidentally prick yourself, puts it in his flight suit pocket. On the third strip search, the KGB find this device. He goes, oh, be very careful with that. He did not want to have a murder conviction on top of an espionage conviction. He is already in enough trouble. So the Soviets test the device on a dog. The dog dies in 20 seconds from asphyxiation. It dies from lack of oxygen. Now, from my research, this is where the left hand and the right hand of the government doesn't always know what the other is doing. The pilots are given the option to take this. They are not ordered to take it. They are not ordered to use it. Eisenhower is assured that no pilot will live through a shoot down. Little disconnect there. Um, and then uh, the other thing um, is in regards to oh, uh, the, 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 the um, cover story. The cover story that was released indicated that the pilot had radioed trouble with his oxygen equipment. Well, had dad used the pin, he'd have died from lack of oxygen. Plausible deniability. But nobody told the pilots what the cover story was. Again, optional to take optional to use at the pilot's discretion in the event of torture. Hmm. Wow. Um, all right. I, uh, I also want to ask, um, and then we can, uh, I'd like to ask about this picture, which I found from the National Cryptologic Museum. And I don't know, you know, where these artifacts came from, what you might know about them. Yes, I, I know them. Um, <laughs> I, I, very well. So these items are on display currently at the National Cryptologic Museum, which is the NSA, National Security Agency Museum, next to the NSA headquarters at Fort Meade, Maryland. Um, the director of the Central Armed Forces Museum back, and I don't know when, the mid-90s, I think, uh, came over and presented what's in the middle and maybe everything, I'm not sure if you printed everything or not, but in the middle is the piece of the U-2 wreckage. So it's under plexiglass. You can see it in the mirror behind uh, as well as in front, but that's actual U-2 wreckage that was presented to the NSA Museum by the Central Armed Forces Museum. In addition, you've got some other little Cold War artifacts. You've got some pieces of the Berlin Wall in the lower corner. 
um, some Soviet, uh, a Soviet uh, uh, Air Force officer's hat, uh, the epith epithets, I think, epithets uh, that are the shoulder boards. Um, and then I want to say that that lock on the lower right is from one of the prisons, but I'm not sure if it was dad's prison or not. I don't want to miss both uh -huh. there. Okay. Uh, and then the little uh, uh, coffee mug or, or beer stein uh, that talks about uh, the uh, separation of Germany, uh, the division into the four quadrants, uh, Soviet, French, UK, and American. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure when I saw that. I'm like, wow, I've never, never seen that before. So maybe we can talk very briefly about your father's release and then a little bit about his, um, his life after returning. We talked about him as a, as a uh, Lockheed pilot, but also what else he did. And then we can um, also talk about the Cold War Museum as well. Sure. Let's go back for a moment. I'll talk about this photo next. Uh, show the one of the people on the bridge first. All right. So um, that photo there, it is my understanding, was taken on the morning of the exchange on February 10th of 62. But it was taken about four or five hours after it occurred. Uh, and oftentimes that will be used as the photo of the exchange. It is not, but it is of that day. Um, after 21 months in prison, my father is exchanged at the Glenacher Bridge in Potsdam, Germany for Soviet spy Rudolf Abel. Abel's on the uh, east, I'm sorry, Abel's on the west side. My father's on the east side. They're positively ID'd. They walk home to their respective freedoms. Abel returns home a hero of the Soviet Union. Parade in his honor, poster stamp in his likeness, and medals for his arrival. Dad returns home to a lot of controversy. People didn't understand what he had gone through. They've read editorials in the newspaper while my father's incarcerated saying he defected, he landed the plane intact, he spilled his guts and told the Soviets everything he knew, or he hadn't followed orders and committed suicide. And so this is what the press was writing. Well, when dad gets back home, he is exonerated of any wrongdoing. He is cleared by the CIA after three weeks of debriefings. They finally realize he's telling the truth. He did everything he was supposed to do. He followed their instructions to the T. He's then put on um, a, a stage at a Senate Select Committee hearing. This is a photograph of dad at the hearing showing off the U-2 model that was used to explain to the senators how the plane was shot down and fell out of the sky. Um, the senators there included Prescott Bush, President Bush's grandfather, Barry Goldwater, Al Gore Sr., um, and other senators of that time, uh, including uh, Senator Dick Russell. So those senators, after eight hours of questions and answers back and forth, grilling my father um, at the end, they exonerate him of any wrongdoing. They show him to be a fine young man performing well under dangerous circumstances, and they basically give him a standing ovation. If we can play that, there's this clip here that you've got um, of the uh, video, what do you call it? That's it, let's play that, that's perfect for this point. Okay, now hopefully people will be able to hear, the, uh, hear this. U-2 pilot Francis Gary Powers makes his first public appearance since he was exchanged for Soviet spy Rudolf Abel. Powers testifies before the Senate Armed Services Committee using a model of his plane. His capture and trial in the Soviet Union caused an international furor in 1960. Now he is vindicated by the Central Intelligence Agency and praised by the senators. Still a mystery is the external explosion which sent his super-secret reconnaissance plane down deep inside Russia. Mr. Bauer, can you please explain to our audience what you told the uh, senators inside about the explosion? Could you please repeat the, that moment? Well, I don't have much time. All I know is that there seemed to be an explosion. I don't know what caused it, but I feel that it uh, was not in the aircraft itself. Can you talk about that it was a rocket? I can't say that. I, I just know that... Uh, think that it was external. Okay. I got there. I Mr. Powers, you said the Russians told you repeatedly that you were hit by the first shot the, of the rocket. The, not the first, the very first. By the very first yes. shot of the rocket. Yes. And you said they said it so often that you were inclined to believe that they didn't believe it. Now, could you explain that? No, I said that they said it so often that uh, I was inclined not to believe it. Uh, if they had used the rocket, it seemed to me that... Uh, the act would have spoken for itself, and they shouldn't have to keep 
telling me that it was a very first shot or something. Like that. You okay. feel really it might have been a near miss. Is that your own feeling? Well, I'm about? sure that there was no uh, uh, direct hit. There was no impact of any kind. I think it might have been a sidewinder type of air to air missile. I really can't say. I don't know. So dad was being a little uh, elusive there. Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the things uh, that, I, that I wanted to mention in regards to that, um, uh, and I just blanked on my, my thought process, but um, this is at the, at the uh, Senate Select Committee hearing. Uh, you saw the um, uh, interview of my father directly after being uh, praised by the senators and exonerated. Uh, unfortunately, that was a little too late because of all the negative press. Dad's reputation was tarnished uh, for many years. Um, and some people still believe that he uh, had a flame out or that he descended or that he defected or that he spilled his guts. And nothing I can say will ever change their opinion. But I can, through my book, show what I have found to be the truth. And he did everything he was supposed to do. Um, so let's move on and we'll go from there. Okay. Um, I did want to touch on um, the gentleman who was involved with um, the yes. exchange, and then maybe we can go ahead and, yep. and wrap up. And this is James Donovan. Uh, James Donovan uh, is no relations to Wild Bill Donovan, who was the head of the OSS, the founder of the OSS, the precursor to the CIA. Um, while Bill Donovan was in World War I, he was a silver, a Medal of Honor recipient, um, and he was in charge of the OSS. That would be going in, parachuting behind enemy lines, the, the black uh, makeup on your face, uh, the saboteurs uh, detonating uh, explosives at the heavy water uh, plants in Germany to prevent the Germans from becoming a nuclear, uh, getting the nuclear bombs. So anything they would do, uh, the OSS would go in and do those type of uh, black op operations. So Donovan was part of the OSS. I'm not sure to what extent or what he did. He may have actually been in their legal counsel for all I know, but he was also instrumental at the Nuremberg trials. He was on their prosecution team. So at the Nuremberg trials, he was there right after World War II. So he was already involved with and, and was uh, friendly with intelligence uh, operatives and, and, and the military and, and the behind the scenes things that go on in Washington, DC. So he was tasked back when Abel was caught to represent him. They wanted to show the world how American democracy and the legal system works, that everybody is innocent until proven guilty. Unlike in the Soviet Union, where you are guilty until proven innocent. A very big distinction there. So Donovan agreed to represent the Soviet spy. As a result, his reputation was tarnished. What do you mean you're representing a Soviet spy? Why are you doing that? I mean, he's, a, he's a, uh, an enemy to the, to the state here. Um, but he thought it was his du uh, duty to represent this individual the best he could to show the world how the legal system in America works. And so he did a very good job. He prevented Abel from getting the death penalty. He basically said, you know, sometime there might be one of our guys that is caught or captured, and we can use this guy as a way to exchange for hours. We should keep him alive. So that's one of the reasons he got a 30-year sentence is to keep him in cold storage in case we needed to use him for a spy swap. And sure enough, that's what happens. Um, Donovan was very big in New York politics. He ended up being a head of the school system in New York State. He ran for Senate sometime in the late 60s. He lost. He died in 1970 from a heart attack. He published his book, Strangers on a Bridge, in 1965. And basically, that book talks about his representation of Soviet spy Rudolf Abel, what he did during the court proceedings and the uh, trial briefings to represent the Soviet spy, and then what he did behind the scenes to negotiate the release of my father in exchange for Rudolf Abel. So that's a very good book. Uh, it talks all about the Soviet spy uh, from James Donovan's viewpoint. Oh. 
Awesome. <clears throat> All right. Well, there's one more photograph that I do. Well, oh, I also want to see, if, just kind of get your comment on this. And I had totally forgotten about um, Lee Majors. And I almost put a, a photograph up. I think, was your father involved as a consultant for, the, for this movie or um, any comments on that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, to the left, you'll see my dad's autobiography, Operation Overflight, that he wrote in 1970. Uh, that movie was turned into a, uh, that book was turned into a made for TV movie for Channel 4 back in 76. Um, I am 11-ish years old at the time. Uh, all of a sudden, this movie is being made about dad and it's starring Lee Majors. Well, Lee Majors in 1976 was the bionic man. He was just Hollywood royalty. Um, he was uh, on every commercial, he was on every TV. I mean, he was every little boy's dream. Wow, the bionic man, they can rebuild him. We can make him stronger, we can make him faster. And that was my favorite TV show as a kid. So I was more impressed meeting Lee Majors then knowing a movie was being made about my dad. <laughs> I can't blame you. Loved, loved that show. And so um, that is the VHS copy of the Francis Gary Power Story. Yeah. And that's, um, um, let's go to the other picture here to the left where you were just on. Yeah. yeah. This one I family, wanted to show too. Yeah. Family photos. Uh, my mom and my dad, when they were married in Catlett, Virginia, and I want to say November of 63, I want to say. Um, dad was married to his first wife. Mom was married to her first husband. Those marriages ended up in divorce back in uh, the 50s and 60s. Um, and then they met, uh, oh, in the 50s, they met in 62 upon my dad's return home. Courtship ensued after dad was divorced and they were married in 63. The right photograph is uh, my dad, my mom, my sister in the background of me, of the little kid up in the front. That was taken in about 69. I'm four or five years old. And that was the photo used for dad's book, uh, the family photo that's in it. Okay. And then um, this one I just wanted to touch on. And then we can talk about Cold War Museum and wrap things up and sure. do a little Q&A. When dad came home, um, debriefed by the CIA, exonerated by the uh, senators, um, didn't, um, uh, he wanted to go back in the Air Force, but the Air Force was a little squeamish because he was a known spy. He ends up working for Lockheed between 1963 and 1970. In 1970, his book is published. He's on the lecture circuit for the next two years between 70 and 72, promoting his book. Then in 72, the right, the, I'm sorry, the left photograph, he gets a job with KGIL radio station in the San Fernando Valley, flying a fixed wing Cessna, which he is in, uh, around the LA area, reporting on news, weather, and traffic. I used to fly with my father in the mornings before school or after school for his uh, uh, radio reporting and commentary with, when, with KGIL. He then got a job with KNBC Television, the photo on the right. He gets that in 1976. He is trained to fly the Bell Jet Ranger helicopter that you see in the background. You see the big ball on one side. There's another one on the other side. One's a camera, one's a radar, or, or what do you call it? The equipment that beams the image to the station for broadcast. Um, Dad flew the helicopter from 1976 to August 1st of 77. That's the helicopter that he crashed in on August 1st, uh, which is, um, what, I don't know, 40 some years ago now? Wow. <clears throat> yeah, it was amazing. All right. So. And the Cold War Museum. If you'll let me take over from here to share the screen. Yeah, let me see um, if I can give you the screen. Hold on. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop share. Can you share or do I need to, I may need to give you control. Yeah, probably. All right, hold on. Um, I'm going to make you host so you'll be able to share. Okay. I think I'm there. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, what I want to show here while I'm talking are a few websites. 
Uh, and we'll start with uh, GaryPowers.com. If anybody would like to get in touch with me after this uh, program, I can be reached at GaryPowers.com uh, through the contact um, uh, page. Oops, can I get to the contact page? Oh, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's over. It's on the right side. You go down to contact and you can reach me. Um, if anybody's interested in my book, Spy Pilot, uh, and or Letters from a Soviet Prison, you can go to spypilotbook.com or garypowers.com. You click on the link. It'll take you to a little gift store. Oh, well, I thought it took you to the gift store. Um, it takes you to the gift store where you can buy one of the books, the hollowed out spy coins, um, the movie Bridge of Spies, or if there are any autograph collectors out there, I'm an avid autograph collector. I've been collecting autographs since I was 10 years old. Um, I have signed copies of my dad's checks if anybody's interested. So that's just a little store that I have on my website. Um, we've got, oops, hold on one second. I got to get to, there we go. Nope, oh, that's not it. So if anybody's in the Washington, D.C. area and you're looking to do a spy tour of Washington, please let me know. I can take groups out from one to 14 people in a passenger van or groups of 30 to 50 in a charter bus. If your group in Pennsylvania wants to come down for a weekend, we can organize an overnight trip drop points, safe houses, a dinner at a restaurant, then back up to Pennsylvania, you go. My brother would love to do that. So we need to talk about that. Sure. <laughs> um, so this is the Cold War Museum website. Um, I founded the Cold War Museum in 96 to honor veterans, preserve history, and educate kids about this time period. I found out when I was doing all my research that hundreds of thousands of other men and women had fought, sacrificed, some of which who died during this conflict. My dad's well known because he got caught spying on behalf of America. Well, these other hundreds of thousands of individuals didn't have any recognition. And so I thought it was very important to honor our Cold War veterans. I also realized that kids had no clue about the Cold War. In 1995, um, I am lecturing in Northern Virginia to high schools about the Cold War that had ended five years previously. I walk into classrooms, I get blank stares from the kids. They think I'm there to talk about the U2 rock band. <laughs> so I knew that something had to be done to preserve this Cold War history. So in 96, I end up founding the museum, Honor Vets, Preserve History, Educate Kids. It has opened on the weekends uh, since 2011. We, for 15 plus years, were collecting artifacts while we were still trying to get a brick and mortar facility. We have one of the largest collections of civil defense items in America. We have items from the USS Liberty, the USS Pueblo, overhead reconnaissance platforms, radio receivers and transmitters from Vint Hill Farm Station, which was the listening base, listening post NSA used to monitor embassy communications back in the day, um, and, and hundreds and thousands of other items related to the Cold War. So more information online at coldwar.org. And you can visit it on weekends, staffed by volunteers. The last thing I want to mention is this website here. NSA stands for National Security Archive, not National Security Agency. This is a uh, group out of George Washington University that declassifies and publishes declassified records of, of, of the Cold War and other eras. This particular page is the secret history of the U-2 in Area 51. This is what was released back in, I want to say, 1998, Fort McNair, downtown D.C., a declassification conference hosted by the CIA and the Air Force that really helped to gather information and it opened up the door for all this stuff. When you get to this page, you can go through the chapters and it'll talk to you about the U-2 program from 54 to 74, including the final overflight about my father and what was going on after my father was shot down. This conference was very important for two reasons, three reasons. First, it actually declassified the altitude at which my father was flying on May 1st. So from that moment on, I was able to say 70,500 feet and know that I was accurate. Second, it was revealed that the U2 program was a joint military and uh, uh, a, a civilian agency operation. The CIA, the Air Force working together hand in hand. For all intent and purposes, it was a military operation. 
And when that was declassified, that it was a military operation, that opened up the door for dad to be posthumously awarded and recognized by our government as a hero to our country. At first, in 96, 97, I started to write some letters to the Air Force Review Board. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I write to you today as the son of Gary Powers. He spent two years in a Soviet prison. I'm inquiring if that qualifies him to be the recipient of a POW medal. Makes sense to me. Well, they didn't think so because civilians are not allowed that medal. And the Cold War was not one of the directives where those medals could be issued. But in 1998, as a result of this declassification conference, showing that it was a military program, that opened up the door for dad to receive the POW medal in 2000 and eventually the Silver Star in 2012. And in my book, Spy Pilot, I go through how that all occurred. So I figured I'd better show you this so you can go do a little research on your own. Uh, this is an awesome, excellent uh, historical record of the U-2 program, uh, the U-2 incident, and my father's involvement. So I will turn this back over to you now. Okay. And there we go. Great, thank you. All right. Well, that was fantastic, Gary, as always. Um, one of our favorite speakers. Um, I know that uh, we're running a little long, but I would like to have a brief Q&A if anyone uh, is so inclined. I know there was someone who had raised his hand, but I think he had to possibly leave early. So I apologize we didn't get to uh, his question, but uh, I'd like to open the lines for any questions people may have. I, I think Dan Myers, you had a question too. Dan, you can feel free to add, to ask the question, or I can go back into chat and. Uh, nope. I, think okay. I was just wondering if uh, the the question I sent to you did the pilots practice stalling the engine and then uh, recover? Ah, um, did the pilots practice flame outs? I guess is what you're saying, stalling the engine for, and going to descend it. Yes, um, they did practice that uh, in training, uh, sometimes intentionally, and sometimes. Oops, there's a flame out. I got to go restart the engine. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Thank you. And if there are any questions that anybody would like to ask and there's not time tonight or you don't want to ask it in the public forum, uh, please feel free to contact me at GaryPowers.com. I'll be glad to talk with you and answer any questions you may have afterwards. Okay. Or feel free to send them through us and we can get them to Gary and get them answered for you. And I am always looking for lecture venues, whether virtually or in person. I prefer in person because I can sell books and I can add on three or four more stops and do a lecture circuit for a week. Um, so I have a one hour program. It would be a formal presentation, not, not similar to what we just did. It's like a Q&A session here, but a formal one hour and I'll go through from A to B in that sequence and talk to you about uh, the books and my father and what happened to him. Uh, in addition, um, if um, uh, you're aware of those locations, let me know. Um, I'm always on the lookout for lecture venues. So thank you. All right. Mr. Powers, um, this is Joan. Um, I read the, the, the uh, spy pilot and um, uh, the other one that's... Letters? The letters from a Soviet prison? Yes. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Jim Donovan's book. Oh, uh, 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 Strangers on a Bridge. Yes, yes. And it seemed to me that there were um, there were measures taken in both cases to be a little more lenient with both Rudolf Abel and your father. Uh, I guess that was probably a propaganda thing. Did you ever meet Jim Donovan or talk to him about anything to compare the, the two imprisonments? Um. I was not able to talk with uh, Jim Donovan. He died in 70. I was five years old. I have, however, as a result of Spielberg's movie in 2015, Bridge of Spies, met with uh, the Donovan children and grandchildren. Uh, Beth Ambrosia, Ambrosia, I'm saying that last name incorrectly, I'm sorry. Um, but the granddaughter and I, uh, she worked, I worked with her to republish her grandfather's book that you saw uh, earlier. Um, I was also um, 
uh, able to do a, uh, a conference or a program or two uh, with uh, Britt Donovan, his son, and Mary Ellen Donovan Fuller, his, one of his daughters, uh, at various locations around the country back four or five years ago. So we have established a very nice rapport. Uh, I am in communication with them by Facebook and or email. Uh, and if everything works out, Mary Ellen and I, uh, along with uh, my co-author, will be down in uh, Noonan, Georgia, sometime in the next uh, eight months uh, to do a program down there all together. So uh, they're a great family. Uh, we've had a lot of fun times together and we've been able to you know, share notes and put pieces of the puzzle together. Any, any other questions? Okay. Well, I know we're running late, but this was fantastic. Really appreciate your time, Gary, um, once again. And uh, I wanna thank you. This is a great kickoff to our 2021 webinar series. And uh, I just want to um, encourage everyone to come back in March um, for our next lecture. We actually are, um, Alice George is gonna be speaking about her book about John Glenn. Um, as you may, some of you may know, um, 2021 is the centennial anniversary of John Glenn's birth. And he did actually train uh, at Johnsville before mm -hmm. his uh, space flight. So uh, definitely come back to talk about Alice um, and uh, definitely looking forward to that next month. So uh, Gary, um, thanks again very much for this. And uh, you know we'll, we'll be in touch and stay tuned because Gary may be back if and when we can get back online, back in Johnsville. So fingers crossed, everybody. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in and uh, having a conversation with Gary Powers. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>